Well, I am Khalid Tinesti. I am the director of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, and I'm very delighted to be here with you and with our speakers from Geneva, from Manchester, uh, and from Accra in Ghana, and all the audiences around the world. We're here to discuss the uh, launch of the special issue on drugs and development uh, with the International Development Policy Journal based here in Geneva at the Graduate Institute. We will have a very um, interesting debate today with quite a unique set of speakers. We have with us Professor Marie-Laure Salle, the director of the Graduate Institute, who welcomes us here. We have with us Madame Ruth Dreyfus, the uh, former president and former federal counselor of Switzerland, who is also known for the implementation of the four pillar strategy in Switzerland and who has been the chair of the Global Commission until last August. Uh, we have with us also Dr. Sh Shannon Hayder, who is the deputy executive director of UNAIDS and who will be talking uh, about the UN Common Position on Drugs and on Drug-Related Matters. We have with us Dr. Julia Buxton, who is the British Academy Global Professor in Criminology at the University of Manchester. And Julia is a co-editor of this special issue with us. Uh, we have also Dr. Mansfield, who is a independent consultant and one of the most preeminent experts on rural communities and on alternative development in Afghanistan. We have then Dr. Karina Giacomello, who works on the gendered impacts of current repressive drug policies, and she will be talking to us about her article on women drugs in Mexico. We, and we will close with Dr. Mary Chineri Hesse, who is joining us from Accra, and who will be uh, giving us her closing remarks. Uh, very briefly, uh, I would like to now start by giving the floor to, my, to Professor Marie-Laure Salle, who has welcomed us in here at the Maison de la Paix in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khalid, and uh, good day to, to all of you all over the world. Welcome to virtually to the Maison de la Paix, and welcome to the launch event of the special issue of DevPol, our in-house journal here at the Graduate Institute. Let me start by thanking the team behind DevPol for all the work and the energy they put in this important outlet, outlet for us. Thank you to Hugo Panizza, to Christophe Giron, to Graziella Mores Silva, to Martin Damari and Marie Thondal. DevPol is what the Institute is all about. It carries cutting edge academic research with an interdisciplinary perspective on important topical and urgent questions with an international scope and reach. Let me also take the opportunity to thank the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation and the Service de la Solidarité Internationale du Canton de Genève for their unfailing support on this project. I'm particularly delighted to be here today for this event that marks the official launch of the special issue coordinated by the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Special thanks should go to Khalid, whom you just, just heard, the president of the Global Commission, for all the energy, the drive, and enthusiasm which were key to both the publication of the special issue and the production of a series of online discussions around the topic of the impact of drug policies on development goals. Let me also thank very uh, pointedly uh, Madame Ruth Dreyfus, and she doesn't need any introduction, but also all panelists who uh, are with us today online, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from, from them. This publication comes at about the same time that the state of Oregon has decriminalized all forms of drugs usage. The policy debate on whether repressive policies work whether they achieve their goal of eradicating drugs production, distribution, and use is an ongoing and complex debate. By discussing these questions and proposing possible alternatives to repressive policies, this volume provides an important input for policymakers who are interested in promoting, uh, promoting a, a reflexive thinking on, on, uh, on those issues that contribute to broader goals uh, associated with sustainable development. The input, if you look at the special issue, I was really struck by uh, an input that is both kaleidoscopic, kaleidoscopic in the sense that it brings together many different perspectives 
different disciplines, different places, different situations, different domains, but also very coherent and very, uh, therefore, you know, helping us understand the issues in a, in a much broader, much more systemic kind of manner. The strength and the impact of this issue is due to the collaboration between scholars on the one hand and the Global Commission on Drug Policy, bringing in various actors, policy makers, practitioners from around the globe. I have no doubt that the debate will be rich and very stimulating. Thank you all once again for making this possible. And let it all start now with Madame Dreyfus. Ladies and gentlemen, all over the world, Madame la Directrice, dear uh, Marie Lorsal, thanks to the Graduate Institute for its role of this event and for your welcoming in the Maison de la Paix. This House of Peace is a flagship for the Genevan international ecosystem. It offers a platform on which academic research and education meets agencies of the UN system, even private enterprises trying to make positive impact investment and philanthropy, so as internationally acting non-governmental organization. Beside the academic activities for which the House of Peace was built, it is host of many initiatives joining science and advocacy for reforms. One of them, is the Global Commission on Drug Policy, a group of 26 personalities from politics, culture, economy, former head of states or government, former leaders of the UN, Nobel Prize winners, and so on. His very active and devoted secretariat, under the leadership of its director, Khalid Tinasti, counts among his many activities the connection with the international ecosystem in Geneva. Our high-level advocacy for reforming drug policies is based on facts and not on ideology, on scientific evidence and on evaluations of innovations implemented either in full scale or as pilot projects at local or national levels. Today, I have the pleasure to present to you the last example of how fruitful the collaboration is. And it is due to the team in the DEFPOL journal. They were mentioned, Jenna Forster, Christophe Gironde, Hugo Panizza, and all their colleagues, who have welcomed this partnership with the Global Commission. The DEFPOL journal is providing the right platform to discuss the impacts of repressive drug uh, control on global development objectives. This partnership is key for the Global Commission, as my fellow colleagues and myself have built our strategies on advocacy, on the work of researchers and scientists, and on the reality on the ground. We have also always insisted on taking drug policy out of its walls and to show its cross-cutting nature over many other policy uh, issues. Here in Geneva, we tend to fall into the same traps as in other international cities, that of partial views linked to the mandates given to the different organizations. To take an example, if in drug policy, the prism of public health or fundamental rights for those criminalized was crucial to, change, uh, to start changing drug policy, it is not enough to solve the issues. This special, issue, uh, the, this special number uh, shows that a broader view is necessary. It presents the interlinks that drug policy creates between different areas of intervention for public policy. At the Global Commission, the sustainable development uh, is a, uh, in, uh, the link between uh, sustainable development and drug policy has been on our radar since the beginning. And we closely followed the process 
of the UN General Assembly leading to the adoption of the SDGs. We analyzed in a position paper how drug policy impacts on the realization of all of the 17th Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. Indeed, poverty eradication is hardly achievable for some populations without drug policy reform. Punitive ac approaches fail to uh, recognize that for millions of people worldwide, organized criminal uh, organizations involved in the illegal drug market provide incomes, basic services, and stability that the state fails to produce. In these lost territories, many governments have merely focused on policing and military intervention to curb illegal activities without fostering alternative employment and providing essential services such as access to clean water, to education, to housing, to health care, and to safety. As many articles confirm in its death poll, crop eradication has also poverty introduction. Opium, coca, and cannabis are cultivated in some of the most isolated areas of the world where the state's presence tends to be limited. Many of these areas are also plagued by high level of inequality and inequal access to land tenure. In northern Laos, forced eradication campaigns in the 20th were followed by a rice shortage. In Myanmar, opium bans, opium bans in 22-23 resulted in, a few, in some region in a 50% uh, drop in school enrollment and the closing of two-thirds of pharmacies and medical facilities. The first part and articles by Buxton, Mansfield, Collins, and Bombacher and David provide the reader with a complete view of these negative impacts. Women. Women are particularly vulnerable to engaging in the illegal drug trade because gender inequalities hamper their access to education and employment. In Latin America, the women targeted by policing efforts are overwhelmingly single mothers in situation of high economic vulnerability with little formal education and limited job opportunities. Their incarceration for lengthy periods of time only pushes them and their children further into poverty and crime as their criminal records hamper their access to employment after release from prison. Giacomello's article on the impact of current policies in wi on women, their families and communities in Mexico is a powerful piece that it highlights the multifold gender-based negative consequences. The special issue also confirms, and this can be seen in the Shaibe and Aliyah uh, article on South Africa, that drug use takes place across all continents, ages, social classes, and genders. However, repressive drug policies and the lack of access to health and social services generally affect the poorest, most marginalized segment of society. Furthermore, criminalizing people who use drugs merely increase stigma and marginalization, acting as a barrier to their education, employment, health, and social services. Drug law enforces disproportionately targets ethnic minorities group discrediting the ju uh, justice system by this arbitrary. In the United Kingdom, black people are six times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. Even so, the prevalence of drug use among black people is lower than among white people. In Brazil, which has the world's third largest prison population, 64% uh, of all Brazilian prisoners are black, and one-third incarcerated men are there for drug trafficking, rising to two-thirds among women. 
The illegal nature of the drug trade has resulted in a huge and lucrative illegal market currently estimated at US dollar around 5,500 uh, billion, which has inevitably fueled corruption at the highest level of policy making. Evidence has shown uh, that fragile start institutions provide fertile ground for the illegal drug production and trafficking to flourish. We can see the details, sources, and outcomes of the power of this money wall on legal institution in the articles by Raitano and Tinasti. As highlighted by Sete, there is an overwhelming evidence that these health dangers can be easily prevented through non-discriminatory access to general health care, as well as well-funded and widely available harm reduction measures. Instead, people who use drugs are met with police harassment, humiliation, and physical abuse, and are registered in policy record. Look, locking up people who use drugs in compulsory detention or rehabilitation center without trial is common practice across Asia and Latin America, despite a strong call by 12 UN entities to stop such a harmful approach. An area that was under discussion, uh, discuss, uh, discussion in drug policy is the environmental impact. DEFPOL have been lucky to have a comparative study by Afsani on the environmental impact of cannabis production in Rif, Morocco, and California, US. In this article, we see the impacts of massive production on soil degradation, access to water, or intensive farming. And uh, Fordham reminds that SCG 17 acknowledges the critical role played by civil society and the need to promote effective civil society partnership. Civil society organization have played a vital and unique role in analyzing drug issues, delivering services, and evaluating the impact of policies and programs. Fordham discusses also the roles played by right holders, people who use drugs, subsistence farmer, and affected communities, and stakeholders, civil society, governments, academia, highlighting their inclusion or exclusion of the drug policy process in the international, on the international level. I would like to thank everyone who is involved in this global launch today, from the co-editor, Julian Buxton and Marie Chinari Hesse, to Martin Damery and Einur Asadli, who organized this event, and UNAIDS for presenting the UN Common Position on Drug-Related Matters. There are also a series of regional presentations of this special issue in partnership with local university, our team partnership with Melaya University, with the University of Pretoria, the Irish Trinity College, the Catholic University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and the Mar Moroccan Policy Center for the New South. To conclude, just a call. Countries must assess the implication of their drug policies for all relevant sections of their national plans to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. They should determine the impact of drug policies on people's lives, on public safety, and on the well-being of co communities as well as on social cohesion and development. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Madame Leifus, for this comprehensive and complete presentation of all the parts and the articles of the special issue on drugs and development. Uh, I would like to apologize for having had the mask before, if you couldn't hear me in the introductory remarks. Uh, if, on this uh, opening remarks, the last person to join us, the last, but very far from being the least, is, of course, Dr. Ch Shannon Hader, the Deputy Executive Director of UNAIDS, who, of course, has been facing the, uh, the um, in, infection and transmission of HIV among people who inject drugs and non-injection uh, practices of transmission, but also who has been working on a global approach to drug policy and uh, to, to, uh, to drug policy through the UN Common Position. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Hader. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to the chairperson and the organizers for this uh, opportunity to speak on the UN Common Position on Drug Policy. And congratulations to the Institute and all the co-authors for this uh, very impactful and very timely uh, issue. So as you mentioned, I come to the issue of drug policy from an HIV and a public health perspective. In 2019, more than 12% of the estimated 14.2 million people who injected drugs globally were living with HIV. The risk of acquiring HIV is 29 times higher for a person who injects drugs than for the general population. Yet decriminalization, harm reduction, and a human rights-based approach can have a huge impact on reducing HIV transmission among people who use drugs. And by reducing transmission, we save lives. Over two years ago, we released the UN Common Position on Drug Policy. This was the first time that the UN agreed on the need to decriminalize drug use and committed to taking actions to promote it. It reiterated the global support for harm reduction, and it mentions the International Drug Control Convention. Um, it urges us that they be consistent with international human rights obligations. So today, where are we in terms of progress and adoption of the UN common position? In 2019, 111 out of 134 countries reported that they do criminalize drug use or possession for personal use. Only 23 countries allowed for legal possession of certain amounts of drugs. In terms of harm reduction, 53 countries reported national policies with explicit reference to harm reduction, but less than 1% of people who use drugs live in countries with adequate full coverage of elements like needle exchange programs, and opioid substitution therapy. Harm Reduction International's latest report shows that access to harm reduction services has not improved globally since 2018. So the UN system uh, commonly calls for active involvement and participation of people who use drugs, active involvement in governance and policy and decision-making, in delivering services, and helping to monitor those services to see if what was promised is actually being delivered. Yet decades of stigma and criminalization have negatively affected the freedom of assembly of people who use drugs. In many jurisdictions, they're not allowed to register their networks. Um, although not, you know, hope is not lost, we do see progress. On a positive note, on November 6, 2020, this year, the Russian network of people who use drugs was organized and registered formally. Nevertheless, the role of formal and informal networks is critical in keeping people safe and alive. Uh, one example, during this time of COVID-19, this COVID-19 pandemic, there have been multiple examples where networks of people living with HIV, networks of people who use drugs, were able to continue provision of clean syringes and to advocate for multi-day dispensing of opioid substitution treatment so that during lockdowns, during restrictions on movement, people who use drugs were not prevented from accessing their harm reduction uh, measures. And of course, there's been a lot of resistance to those kind of innovations and flexibilities previously. So we hope that this uh, new flexibility that stems from networks of, of people advocating for the policy change in this context of COVID can continue beyond COVID as well. And so we will look to the future. What are we doing to build that better, to have a better future than we had even before these colliding pandemics of COVID-19? A um, couple of things that from a UN perspective we're working on. At UNAIDS, we're working on the development of the next global AIDS strategy. 
advocating strongly for a specific target on decriminalization of drug possession for personal use. In terms of the UNA's global partnership on HIV-related stigma and discrimination, countries are called on to reduce drug-related and intersectional stigma and discrimination. So the UN common position on drug policy is a great first step, but for implementation, we need everyone's help. We need civil society to play a key role in partnering with the United Nations and implementing monitoring of the common positions, seeing if we are getting the change from member states that we've committed to. We need governments to change laws and decrease criminal enforcement to ensure and to ensure sustainable funding. And we need ongoing evidence and research from experts such as those on this stage to not only help persuade countries, but to also demonstrate the impact of positive implementations as we see them. So I'm truly grateful to see the special issue of the International Development Policy Journal contributing to the body of evidence and raising awareness on the intersection of drug policies, development, and health. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Haider. And um, with your speech actually comes uh, an end to this introductory part, and I will take this opportunity to thank you, thank Professor uh, Marie Lorsal and Madame Maud Dreyfus for your presence and for opening this very important discussion for us. Uh, for the next 25 minutes, we will now have a discussion with authors and co-editors of this special issue. And I have the huge pleasure to welcome in a personal friend, if she allows me to call her like that, but also someone that I look up into in the academia world, and that is Professor uh, Julia Buxton, who has been the co-editor of this special issue with uh, Dr. Mary Chinari Hesse and myself, but who is also has been work is one of the preeminent um, uh, academics working on the interlinks between development and drug control policies for a very long time. So Julia, as I give you the floor, I really would like to think that we would want to hear from you as well the fact that what is the rationale behind this special issue and uh, what is new in this discussion that you have been in for such a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid, and thank you so much for those opening remarks. Um, so much of what I wanted to, to mention really has been addressed there by Madame Dreyfus in, in what was a really comprehensive introduction. Um, but before I just go back to your question, um, just to say my enormous thanks to the DevPol Journal and the Global Commission um, for really helping us produce here an open access journal. And I cannot stress enough how important it is that we have the opportunity to publish open access. We need to move away from academics only publishing in academic journals or university academic presses, which are not accessible to people in other parts of the world. We cannot carry on only producing dusty materials that sit unread on shelves. So thank you so much for this open access opportunity. And I really hope that this enables us to reach a far wider audience than traditional academic publishing would normally allow us to do. Coming back to Khaled's question, um, there, there are three kind of main points I would just like to very quickly distill here in terms of what we're trying to achieve with this journal. The SDGs have this emphasis on no one gets left behind. Our concern is that drug policy says it's actually quite acceptable and legitimate for certain portions of our communities and our societies to be left behind. We feel that this is completely unacceptable and that the development policy and the development community really need to be partners with those of us pushing for drug policy reform. We have completely siloed communities. Development actors and drug policy actors sit in separate communities. And these silos have to be overcome if we are to have progress in ensuring that no one gets left behind. Time is running out. So three key points I want to make here. Firstly, what we try and do in this journal is basically to reiterate what we already know. What do we already know? That international drug policy is failing and has failed. It has failed to contain illicit drug supply and it has failed to ensure that those people requiring access to medical, pharmaceutical, opioid analgesics have access to essential medicines. 
On both counts, this drug policy paradigm has failed. It should not be taboo and it should not be controversial to say that drug policy has failed. We need to be able to have open, honest conversations about what the cause of this failure is and how we can move forward. And the development community are very important partners for us in trying to address this. Unfortunately, due to reputational concerns, arm's length treatments, many people in the development community have not wanted to engage with drug policy debates. This needs to be overcome. These are important partners for us in trying to promote change and the development community itself and development actors have responsibilities to their own constituencies of interest to understand how they are impacted by drug policy failures. My second point here very quickly is that the tremendous harms to development that are caused by implementation need better quantifying. We need better metrics. We have constant debate about improving metrics within the UN system, but this debate is moving far too slowly. We need to have development focused metrics and we need to have gender sensitive, conflict sensitive, rights based approaches mainstreamed in all of our drug policies and drug programs. We cannot continue to wait for this sclerotic, slow process of institutional change within the UN institutions. And this is a key call for us really here. We can't wait for this slow process anymore. If we want to achieve the SDGs, we need to change the way that drug policy is enacted quantified and who is held accountable for the failures of these policies. My final point, my chapter very much focuses on efforts to integrate more development focused approaches into drug policy. We've had alternative development strategies, we've had development oriented drug control, alternative livelihoods. I think the record of these strategies has been very disappointing and it's been very poor. And my concern, and I think this is a, a, an issue that will be picked up by other panelists, is that essentially we're trying to reform and bring development into drug policy, but within an existing criminalization paradigm. Alternative development strategies are not addressing the structural drivers of inequality, and they don't address these big complex issues around land ownership, exclusion from very authoritarian and elitist political systems. We can't have these models effectively changing the way we understand development if they don't engage with the obstacles that criminalization itself creates for meaningful development outcomes. So my final emphasis there really, and what I'm trying to argue in the journal, is that these reform initiatives, these kind of efforts to integrate development are a form of policy bricolage. They are tinkering at the edges of a policy which is failing. We need to acknowledge that failure, we need to broaden out the stakeholders, and we need far more coherent debates around the development aspects of drug policy than we have been able to have. And the development community needs to be part of that discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you for reminding us that now with the um, uh, COVID epidemic and this current situation, global development objectives are indeed in a real risk to be derailed and that the time is running out. I just wanted to remind you that the, any questions for the panelists could be sent through the online chat as you are watching and, they, and we will get there very soon. Thank you very much. Um, uh, now I would like to give the floor to Dr. David Mansfield. And David, um, you are an expert on the rural communities and policies and on alternative development in Afghanistan. I think that it would, it would be very, uh, just if you could give us a brief um, introduction of what is alternative development, because I think we know it in the drug policy world, but others don't. But I just wanted to say that on Monday started here the conference for, the do for international donors for Afghanistan, and we know what the situation is here in Geneva. So we are actually in a very timely discussion with you to see where all of this links and how the alternative development policies of Afghanistan are helping or not helping the global efforts for peace. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Khaled. Um, I appreciate the uh, introduction and uh, the question, and um, thank you very much for the invitation overall. Um, I, you know, to pull in some of the comments that Julia just made, I was uh, at a task over the last 20 years to try to draw together two different communities, the development community and the drugs, drug control community. Um, I worked primarily with the World Bank, the European Commission, the Asian Development Bank, DFID and others. 
essentially trying to get them to engage in, in the drugs issue rather than get the drug controllers to engage in the development issue. And I think we often look to this the wrong way, the wrong way around. My own view on, on Afghanistan, and you know, there was something slightly cathartic about my article, um, is that alternative development was not the model that should be pursued. And as such, uh, and as much as various institutions tried to kill it, it just wouldn't die. There were too many vested interests in reviving it, so it kept rearing its ugly head again and again. My One of the challenges that they did, David, if you, is, is a term that's under, sorry. I'm so sorry, David. We're having an issue you with, your on, with your internet connection and we cannot hear you. So if you allow me, uh, the team will be talking to you now on, your, on this little issue and we'll give the floor to Karina and we'll be coming back to you. All my apologies, but, there is, okay. but I guess this is the joys of the hybrid virtual presence discussion. Sorry about that. Uh, so Karina, I will, if you, if you agree, <laughs> I just wanted to ask, uh, you have, as Madame Dreyfus spoken about your article and the gendered impacts. Um, so these impacts are huge, as we can see in terms of data. Nevertheless, they're never seen and they're never heard and they're not present in the public space and in the public discussion. So I, uh, we, I'll give you the floor, so please, you can share with us the experience from Mexico, but also to learn us what we need to do to make the situation a little bit better. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Khalid. First of all, I want to thank you all for this invitation to the Graduate Institute, to the Global Commission. I hope my connection is working fine. If not, um, you can tell me on WhatsApp. And, uh, and I want to thank you and uh, Julia and Mary Cini for the invitation to be part of this special issue. So uh, it will be great to be there with you as we did a pandemic ago, and hopefully we will be able to do it again and hear the applauses that you all deserve. And, uh, but then going to the, to the point. So yes, I had the opportunity to write on the gender impacts of drug policy, which is what I've been working on for the last 15 years. The case studies are based in Mexico, which is where I do field work and research, but I think they mirror a situation that we find in different countries, especially in developing countries contexts. So the chapter looks at the intersection between gender development and drug policies, and it argues that drug policy is part and parcel of a patriarchal structures that reproduce violence against women. Drug policy is not the main driver or the main factor underlying violence against women, but definitely it is a very handy, practical, rhetorical tool to, um, to maintain it. In the chapter, I look at two groups of women in detention, women in prison for drug-related offences, and women who are arbitrarily detained in drug treatment centres. As Ms. Dreyfus pointed out, uh, compulsory drug treatment is still a reality in many countries in Asia and also in Latin America. And even if we could say that women in prison for drug offences have gathered international attention, it is not the case for women who use drugs and are arbitrarily detained. Um, what the chapter argues is that by criminalizing drug of, well, drug related uh, activities and by stigmatizing drug users uh, and the crossing of these consequences of current drug policy with the gender beliefs and gender based violence, women are exposed to further um, causes and expressions of violence in relation to drug policy. On the one hand, women who are involved in drug offences are exploited by male partners and male-dominated criminal organisations. On the other hand, they are incarcerated at a faster rate than men. The women who use drugs, if we know that criminalism are a consequence of drug policies and drug discourses and narratives for all people who use drugs, they are particularly severe for women and generate symbolic and practical spaces of, uh, of violence against them. Sexual violence, of course, but not only that. So as, a, as for the solutions, um, I think that the international community has taken note of these issues, but pretty much as it happens with um, alternative development, all the policy proposals are, as Julia put it, at the end, or as I put it in my chapter, they're only cosmetic changes. 
because they do not, do not promote a, a deep gender evaluation, as some scholars call it. That is, they do not look at how drug policy is part of patriarchy and it helps reproduce it. So, of course, we have a very important proposal that have to be uh, put into place, such as having the sex disaggregated the data implement alternatives to incarceration, include the best interests of the child as one of the arguments not to incarcerate the drug users, but to think of the impacts of current drug policies on the children of people who use drugs or that are involved in drug trafficking and on children per se. But we need, but as long as drug policy, the core of the international uh, drug control system remains untouched, and is based on prohibition, new forms of violence against women and all forms of violence against women who use drugs and who become involved in drug offences for because of poverty, of gender-based violence and caring responsibility will remain unchanged as well. Thank you very much, Corina. I am just looking at my colleagues to see if David has been able to join us and if he would be able to take the floor even with that. So perfect. Please, David, we give you back the floor. As we were saying, we were speaking about alternative development in Afghanistan, and the, the idea is uh, about your article, but also the general view, uh, the gen your work more generally as a researcher, but as also a practitioner on the impact of alternative development, crop substitution, crop eradication, and infrastructure in rural communities in Afghanistan. Thanks, Kelly. In response to your question about alternative development in Afghanistan, I would say that alternative development was not the model that should have been pursued. And as much as various institutions tried to kill it, it just wouldn't die. There were too many vested interests in reviving it. So it kept rearing its ugly head again and again. One of the challenges of alternative development is that it is a term that is understood to be different things to different people. This is not a good place to start when beginning a major reconstruction and development effort in a country like Afghanistan. To many, it is a development project specifically aimed at reducing poppy cultivation. The challenge here is different institutions work to quite different change models. The change model adopted by most drug control organizations is that of making assistance conditional on reductions in drug crop cultivation. Targets are set, deals are struck with government officials and elders, and then coercive support is lent to these individuals and institutions, including eradication. These targets are typically laid out in things like drug control action plans, social compacts and other agreements that communities are asked to sign in order to receive the development assistance. As such, development is the means by which, by which to negotiate the end of a poppy. To others, alternative development is just development in a poppy or co coca growing area. And drugs are largely ignored. It's business as usual. Here, the assumption is that the illicit economy grows. As it grows, it will crowd out the illicit economy. In Afghanistan, this is an assumption that has not borne fruit on numerous occasions. Both illicit and illicit economies grow in parallel. The thing was, alternative development interventions are typically area bound implemented in remote marginal area where the state and other development actors have little presence. This is the typical model of other countries. But this kind of discrete project-based approach was not the prevailing environment in Afghanistan in 2002. This was a massive reconstruction effort with multiple actors and what was crowded institutional space. This was a time of large sectoral programs under the auspices of the multilateral and bilateral donors and very large amounts of money being committed. There was no discrete boundary areas for donors to carve off and pursue the kind of alternative development projects they'd done in the past, in part because there were so many other development actors working in the, across different parts of the country, often doing very contradictory things. This was an experience GIZ had, for example, with its program in the east of Afghanistan, where it suddenly found its USAID's money dwarfing its own and the governor of Nangarhar implementing a comprehensive poppy ban. The scale and nature of drug, drug crop cultivation in Afghanistan was also quite different from the usual alternative development effort. Not just the total number of hectares grown, but where it was grown in some of the most productive agricultural land near provincial centers. It was therefore agreed early on in Brussels, December 2001, 
including by one of the architects of Plan Columbia, Rand Beers, that this was not about drug control, but about reconstruction and development. Instead, the emphasis was on the wider development effort, recognizing the drugs economy, understanding its causes and its impacts, and planning and implementing development projects accordingly, so as to support farmers transition out of poppy cultivation. Part of this new beginning was also to rid ourselves of the term alternative development. The prevailing view by most development organizations then, and I would argue today, is that alternative development is a busted flush, as something that did not work and was, and was owned by drug control organizations, organizations that would openly say, we don't do development. I advocated for the term development in the drugs environment, but my boss at the time said it was too much of a mouthful and we needed something that the US government and in particular INL would recognize. He opted for alternative libraries. The intention was to get development policymakers and practitioners to own the drugs issue, fully integrate it both an understanding of the causes and effects of the drugs economy on their development efforts. This meant having a deep understanding of how some development interventions played out on the ground, how farmers from different socioeconomic groups and different areas would respond and to develop mitigating strategies so as not to exacerbate levels of poppy, but most importantly, to not increase levels of inequality and, pop and poverty. On occasion, we had success in integrating drugs as a development issue. For example, it was recognized as such in the National Development Plan, it was incorporated into a number of large World Bank national priority programs, such as irrigation, horticulture, road building, and then latterly into the agricultural strategy of 2014. The World Bank even developed guidelines to support development planners integrate drugs as a cross-cutting issue. However, however, more often than not, success was short-lived. Ultimately, Afghanistan was and continues to be a particularly challenging environment. The high turnover of staff was always an issue. It often felt that no sooner had we begun a conversation supporting development organizations better understand the drugs issue and how to integrate it into their programs, then staff would move on and the conversation would have to start with someone new. Undoubtedly, the biggest challenge was the ever-present performance indicators and political pressure for success in Afghanistan. Like it or not, levels of poppy in Afghanistan were viewed as one of the overall indicators of the success of the state building project. When cultivation increased, there was unrelenting pressure to do something, to rip up past efforts and rewrite strategies. And every time cultivation went up, the drug controllers came to the fore, again, arguing for comprehensive eradication, poppy bans, and of course, alternative development. Those that own the drugs issue, and of course, alternative development, would pop up and say they had the answer. So each time we'd embark on another round of poorly conceived development efforts aimed at reducing poppy at warp speed or mitigating the effects of a ban on poppy that had been implemented. In the US context, development policies would then be dictated by NL, not by USAID. And other donors would be wary of being involved in simplistic contractual devices aimed at reducing poppy in the short term, but where they could see there'll be further problems later on. Things like wheat seed distribution under the Hellman Food Zone, all done under the rubric of alternative livelihoods or alternative development. By this time, no one could see the difference any longer. And the more time and money that was spent on these kind of poorly conceived programs, the more the development community shunned the drugs issue, with some organisations like DFID and USA giving it sufficient money to be seen to be doing something while insulating their wider programmes from what they saw as a, a risk of real engagement. USAID's classic example, where over the last 20 years, it has provided 36 billion to support governance and economic and social development in Afghanistan, while its budget for alternative development was 1.2 billion. And there are major debates over how we can distinguish the programming under this from what was their usual rural development. By 2015, even USAID didn't pretend to engage in the drugs issue. And as we can see today, opium is rarely mentioned in development programs or, in fact, as part of the peace process. Despite the fact that opium continues to be the most, the country's most valuable export and the industry employs more than the ANDSF that we have spent years financing. In 2020, we're now confronted by a growing meth economy 
in Afghanistan, an economy whose output could easily outpace heroin production in Afghanistan. And it's all based on a crop that grows wild in the mountains where opium poppy doesn't grow. These two illicit industries are a significant element of Afghanistan's real economy. Alas, there is still the assumption amongst many that these will either be crowded out by a more stable central government and investments in agriculture, or that an alternative development project will come to save the, save the day somehow. It remains to be seen how much we've learned from these last 20 years, but my article at least went some way to try and document it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just very briefly uh, now, we will get into the questions. So please, again, don't hesitate sending us uh, questions through the chat for everyone that is watching us. So the first question that we got is from Daniel. And we have a, um, so this is an open question to all the panelists. So please, Madame Dreyfus uh, and also uh, Professor Sal, feel free to respond. So uh, the question is that this special issue focuses on alternative development for plant-based drugs. But how does this fit in the new world where new psychoactive substances and synthetic substances are also growing? So that is one first question, basically, why, where is this discussion of synthetic drugs within the development discussion, the global di discussion, and the fact that the production is also shifting and changing from what we used to know in the former policies? We also have another question, which is about why are women more criminalized than men? And also, when we see the Prison populations, women are far more are far smaller than men. So why are women more um, criminalized? And that question would go uh, to Corina, but please, uh, everyone, feel free to intervene as well. Uh, who would like to answer to the first question about uh, the new psychoactive substances and the plant based? Uh, Julia, if you'd like to take the floor. Um, I think that's a fantastically pertinent question um, because the real problem we have with so much of the alternative development is that it's so focused on rural areas and it really kind of reinforces this absolute preoccupation that international drug control has with plant-based substances. They have been locked into plant-based substances since 1909 with the beginning of international drug control efforts, the first kind of debates we had. Synthetics have been completely neglected throughout the history of the control conventions this has been overwhelmingly due to the lobbying influence of pharmaceutical groups. And it's also because so many of these synthetic substances are also produced in the global north. And this means that we see actions, counter narcotics actions in countries like Colombia, um, Afghanistan, that would be unconscionable in the Netherlands. It is absolutely unacceptable uh, to the mind that we would see this kind of repressive, coercive anti-drug strategy in the global north. That's legitimate in the global south. So I, the, the question I absolutely agree with, we should be focusing on synthetics. The challenge is the drug control system has totally neglected them. And that's indicative of the failure to understand urban policies um, and also the synthetic markets. Thank you very much, Julia. Just for the sake of time, uh, we would go directly to the question on the um, criminalization of women so that we can have one last question before the closing remarks of Dr. Maritineri Hesse. So, Karina, if you would like to respond to, the, to this question so that we can go to a last one. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. Thank you. Well, yes, men are definitely, uh, men in prison are, um, much, are, are many more in absolute terms than women and also in the case of drug-related offences. But what we see is a disproportionate criminalization of women, uh, again, in proportional terms. So, for example, Panama. Panama is a trafficking country of cocaine mainly. So you will have a 30% of the male population incarcerated for drug offences, whereas 70% of women in prison are there for drug-related offences. That has to do with the roles that women carry out in drug-related crimes. Basically, they carry the drugs to take them through international borders, into prisons, so they're in touch with the substance. They're very easy to catch. They're very easy prey. They're very easy uh, success to show of the drug on wars. So um, they are more captured in proportional terms in relation to other crimes. That has an impact because the drug policy in, uh, in, 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 the, um, in the criminal aspect has uh, some um, common traits, at least in Latin America. The use of mandatory pretrial detention, and if it's not mandatory by law, it is usually applied. 
long sentences and the implementation of minimum sentences and the lack of access to alternatives to incarceration. So to be criminalized for drug policy has several impacts on the weight and the intensity of the criminal justice system. So yes, they are less in absolute terms, more in proportion, and uh, with the particular impact of uh, the use of the, of the criminal justice system in relation to drug offenses. Thank you very much for that very clear response, Karina. I would give now the floor to our colleague Martin Damari of um, International Development Policy for some questions that are so arriving through the chat and that I cannot have a look at. Thank you. Yes, so I, uh, first question from, uh, from one of the attendees. What do the panelists think about the legal regulation of drugs as a development approach to drug policy reform if regulations are shaped in the interest of social justice, public health, and human rights? I believe that is for Madame Ruth Dreyfus to give us a response. <laughs> I thank you for this uh, question. I think it's very important to see that uh, the idea of uh, putting drug activities, drug uh, production, drug uh, uh, sale, and uh, uh, trafficking under the state control is the solution to avoid the expansion of the criminal organization and is a factor of uh, economic and social development. Why, why is it uh, so difficult to, to make this step? Well, on one side, because we have uh, generally to, to look to adapt the regulation to the risk that the population can uh, have uh, if uh, uh, we go too far, for instance, into a liberalization of the market. I mean, a liberalization in the sense that it is av available without control, that it is in a system like it is now in the black market, a system that is under no control. So we have to learn also for the different substances and the different risks how to deal better with uh, the, the risk that are uh, at stake. Uh, we know we have some examples, not only uh, good ones, in the field of tobacco, of alcohol, and so on, to see what is really necessary to have the prevention that we need for a, a problematic uh, consumption. Now, uh, why uh, an, another reason is uh, clearly that uh, we have a, a straight jacket from the International Convention, and uh, the system of reviewing this convention and changing the international policy is blocked. Is blocked by, on one side, the opposition of very uh, powerful countries, to name the least, uh, the US, uh, China, uh, Japan, and so on. And it is also, uh, it, is, uh, it is blocked also by the decision-taking system in Vienna, uh, which is responsible for uh, the international convention. There is a, a kind of illusion that what should be realized is a, cons a fundamental consensus on all the aspects of drug policy. We are advocating for more freedom for different countries to experiment new solutions without being under the, the, the straight jacket. And uh, this is, I, I would say, the most difficult part is to uh, be able to uh, introduce a real reform process in Vienna. The hope is that many countries are no longer ready to accept this straitjacket and make first experiment in regulation, taking cautiously the le least uh, harmful, if I can say so, uh, uh, at the first step, like uh, cannabis, and now we see in other countries some uh, psychedelic, for instance, uh, who were just accepted uh, in a system of control by a, a U.S. Uh, state. So the question is really on the national level and on this international blockade for reform. 
Thank you very much, Madame Dreyfus. For the sake of time, we will have to end this discussion and this exchange with the panelists here. We still had an, uh, an interesting question on this SDG 17 and global partnerships and funding for demand reduction and supply reduction globally. But for the sake of this discussion, we can continue with the authors. Uh, our, uh, all our emails are available with the co-editors, with the authors. I also wanted to thank the panelists and apologize to, to David that we could not hear. I mean, David is one of the most preeminent speakers on uh, Afghanistan and experts experts around the world for the last 20 years who has worked with all the development agencies. Please look into his article because it is a treasure of information on, um, on drug policy and alternative development in, 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 Afga uh, in Afghanistan. Also thank uh, Karina who woke up at uh, 5 a.m. in Mexico to be with us. <laughs> thank you so much Karina, you can, see, you can still see that it's night behind you. And also of course to Julia who is the co-editor and who has been also such a force behind this special issue with the colleagues at development and international development policy. Uh, thank you so much for the speakers at the opening and for now to close this event, we have an exceptional speaker to me, someone who has been part of the International Geneva as the former deputy director of ILO. She has been a professional of development all of her life, but has also been uh, a member of the West Africa Commission on Drugs that was established by the late Kofi Annan and chaired by Oluse Basanjo from the very beginning, one of the founding members of that commission working with us, our, as our commissioners call it, their sister, their little sister commission in West Africa. So uh, she has been also finally lately been appointed as the Chancellor of the University of Ghana. So I would like to give the floor to Dr. Mary Chineri Hesse. Thank you. Please, Mary, the floor is yours, whenever you're ready. Well, uh, Madam Ruth Dreyfus, panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen from all over the world, it has been my pleasure to join you all from Accra, Ghana. I'm speaking from Africa. But I join us uh, in my capacity as a co-editor of this special issue, and more importantly, as a member of the West Africa Commission on Drugs. I was so delighted to be given the opportunity to co-edit this special issue and to collaborate with Dev Paul Journal to build a 2020 state of affairs of drugs and development. This is because I have been a, a development practitioner the whole of my life and exploring the nexus between drugs and development piques my interest. It's very, very natural for me to want to be part of a, an exercise such as this, which is really emphasizing the need to pay attention to development, even as we discuss the drug policy. I'm also happy to be back in Geneva, where, as you heard, I, I lived for many years. So this has been a very, very good opportunity for me. Important, uh, though, I can say the discussions have been extremely fruitful. And um, a lot of lessons and message, messages which guide policy development for the future have significantly been explored uh, by all the panelists. I think it's been very, very impressive. Uh, as President Dreyfus stated, though, uh, it's important to base analysis and recommendations and advocacy on evidence and the data from the ground. And I think uh, this is the way the issue was handled in terms of the contributions for that particular uh, issue. And um, we in the West Africa Commission on Drugs have adopted a similar approach to that of our bigger sister, uh, the commission, uh, the sister commission, the global commission. I, I, it's an endorsement of our approach. And again, I'm very, very happy um, about that. Uh, we have so much food to enrich our work going forward. And I want to thank the panelists especially for this. The special issue highlights the negative impact of 
oppressive drug policies on people. It also highlights how drug policy efforts focus on repression and have undermined development objectives such as the achievement of the SDGs. These policies continue to reinforce and entrench um, the gender and racial inequalities, as well as exacerbate violence and insecurity and foster corruption. I'm so happy, especially about the emphasis on the impact of all this on women, uh, which is not always discussed uh, um, at the high table. I'm happy that it has been put on the agenda so strongly. And, uh, Thank you so much uh, uh, for that. At today's event, uh, we've heard from policymakers, scientists, and practitioners uh, who have laid out the barriers that drug control poses to sustainable de development. And uh, the messages really have been so pertinent. I'm hoping that it will influence action of the development community. They are the ones who are not exposed to the issues. So as we carry out the advocacy, I would plead that we make sure that the drug policy difficulties are put at the high table when development issues are discussed. Um, let me just uh, refer to one or two things uh, which have influenced us in West Africa. As you must be aware, um, we have become in the last decades a transit hub for cocaine from Latin America and a production space for methamphetamine. To worsen the situation, we are currently experiencing a crisis of counterfeit tramadol a mild pain relief based on opioids. This counterfeit is much more powerful uh, than the original drug and is sold in the illegal market. And this is leading to a lot of overdoses. As we have experienced from handling of the drug situation to date, it should be obvious that the current repressive response to crack down on the prescription of the leg legitimate tramadol will not solve the issue on the illegal market. Rather, it will threaten our pediatric pick and adult pain relief system. And I, I want to emphasize that uh, we have to work to make sure that this does not happen. I also want to draw attention to the uh, need to have a community-led approach to responses. I think this, was, this point also has been made. The people who are most directly impacted should be part of uh, shaping the future of drug policies. We have not managed to do this very effectively, and I'm glad this has come out so clearly from the panelists' and presentation. We must put communities at the center, ensuring that affected communities are meaningfully engaged, as has been a central principle of development policy for decades. This has to be applied to the drug area as well. Uh, it's an accepted principle. I finally want to stress that uh, dominant drug policies criminalize the already marginalized and creates a cycle of poverty and vulnerability for the most impoverished communities throughout the world. It fuels poverty, poor health, environmental degradation, and de deforestation, corruption, and violence. We have many, many, many examples. And I want to say on behalf of the West African Commission on Drugs that we really want to collaborate with everybody. It will improve our own input into finding solutions for our problems 
these are challenges that we need to overcome. For instance, the eradication of crop farms in drug cultivation communities has only not only helped has created health issues, but so many other socioeconomic burdens for poor communities, which are because of time I will not go through. But a lot of this has been uh, has come out of the presentation of the panelists. Um, we are, the today's conversation further buttresses the need for stakeholders' participation and structural reform for meaningful involvement of development partners, but also civil society. I think that uh, they, they have to be at the high table at the point of decision making, rather than coming in from behind when decisions have already been made and which might not necessarily have taken into account uh, what is coming from the ground. It has to be a paradigm change in this regard, uh, even at the international level. Um, they have to have a place at the table that other than being brought in after policy form formulation. My hope today is that the special issue opens the door to an alignment of the responses to drugs with the principles of sustainable development. And um, in the interest of time, I would like uh, to end here, but I would truly like to thank you all who have managed to be part of what I consider to be a historic event. I know I can count on you all at every turn as you collaborate with your partners and colleagues, but also those who will benefit from advocacy in drawing attention to the necessity to posit issues related to development as an integral uh, part of the drug agenda, not as an afterthought. Now, I finally wish to inform uh, you also that uh, the recording will be available uh, on the DEFPOR website. It will be available online. And uh, we will additionally send out satisfaction survey also online for completion. And I hope everybody will complete uh, the online uh, survey. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, it's been uh, my pleasure to see you all from all around the world, uh, even as I sit in Accra. Very, very good. And Ruth, I'm happy to see you. Last time was in Accra. I'm saying, come again. I miss you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, with this, we will be closing this event. I would like to thank, again, all the speakers. I would like to thank the um, opening panel who has taken over their time here to share with us the importance of drug policy in their work, but also to welcome you all to the regional discussion. So this is, as Madame Daifu said, we'll be going around the world in partnership with different universities, so you could have more discussions with authors that have worked on issues related to the region where you are and also thematically. So please uh, keep on watching the uh, Graduate Institute's event page so that you can see all the upcoming events around this special issue that is going to go around the world also in the spring semester of 2021. Once again, thank you everyone. Thank you uh, to the audiences who have, been, uh, who have been listening to us and watching us. Thank you to the co-editors and to the uh, past chair of the Global Commission who has also allowed us to, to have this special issue and to have it existing. And finally, to the colleagues at International Development Policy and the Graduate Institute for the platform and for the possibility of doing this. Thank you, everyone, and hopefully we'll be seeing you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.